I start my sermon, there's uh, something that uh, Grace and I would like to share with you. Seven weeks ago, Grace and I were incredibly blessed with the arrival of our first great-grandchild. God has blessed us more than we we deserve. And uh, our eldest granddaughter named her little daughter Ava and then she added the name Grace in honour of her great-grandmother. So we're exceedingly chuffed over that. Let us bow our head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day when we can pause from our labour and come and honour and worship you, Lord, because you and you alone are worthy of worship, Lord. We ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide me as I deliver the message that you have given me and to open the hearts of of those who hear the message, Lord, that they may learn more about how much you love them and how much you have done for them. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. When we discuss sin and forgiveness, we must go back to the beginning and outline the introduction of sin to this planet Adam and Eve were created not only with an immortal body but with a perfect and sinless nature. They were given dominion over everything that God had created but there was one restriction. They were not permitted to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that stood in the centre of the garden. This was the only restriction that God had placed on them. We read in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Whilst wandering in the garden and admiring its beauty, Eve separated herself from her husband and she found herself in the centre of of the garden, standing and looking up at the tree that produced the forbidden fruit. Her curiosity was aroused by the talking serpent, which was entwined around one of its branches. Eve was familiar with all the animals in the garden as Adam had given each a name, but none had the power of speech like this serpent. Her interest in the serpent was intensified by the curious question that it asked her. Did God really say you must not eat from the tr- any tree in the garden? Even though both Adam and Eve had been warned by their creator and by the heavenly host that they would be tested, Eve engaged in a discussion with the serpent. She did not realise that the serpent was the instrument that would test them. And she did not know that the serpent was in reality Satan, the fallen covering cherub, And as a result of her discussion with the serpent, Satan quickly overcame her. Put simply, Eve trusted in the words of the serpent and she distrusted the words of God. So she ate of the forbidden fruit and she then gave it to Adam who also ate. Now the way that Satan through the medium of the serpent approached Eve is interesting and I want to give you an example. Some years ago, and this is before the introduction of iPhones, 
a social studies student in New York undertook a study. He entered a high-rise building in Manhattan and he went into the lift, went up a few floors and came out. And he did this for a full hour, going in, up a few floors, out. Going down a few floors, in and out. And as he entered, he made the comment, nice weather we are having. And as he came out, he recorded the number of people that were in the lift and the number that responded. Almost none commented other than a mmm. For the second hour, he decided to change tact. He walked into the lift as he time he entered and he said, my watch has stopped. Can someone give me the time, please? Without exception, every person in the lift looked at their watch and gave him the time. Satan obviously knew this trick. Don't waste time making a silly comment. Ask a direct question because it will immediately attract attention and it will force a response. So Satan obviously knew this trick and he asked Eve a direct question. Now, Alan G. White speaks about the fall in Patriarchs and Prophets. She devotes a whole chapter to it to the fall, and it makes extremely interesting reading. Now, I've heard a number of uh, sermons on the fall, and I've often heard it said by people standing up the front who say it was Eve's fault. She was the one that separated herself from her, her husband. She was the one that went and stood in front of the forbidden tree. She was the one that engaged in a discourse with the serpent. She was the one that believed the serpent. She was the one that ate the fruit. She was the one that then gave the fruit to her husband. Now, Alan G. White makes this comment in the Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 231. And this came up for discussion in Lesson 1 of this quarter's uh, uh, Sabbath School lessons. She wrote, It was the deliberate choice of Adam in his full understanding of an express command from God rather than hers that made sin and death the inevitable lot of mankind. Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Soon after eating the forbidden fruit, both Adam and Eve experienced wretchedness and they were suddenly aware that they were naked so they sewed little aprons of fig leaves to hide their shame and when their creator called them the creator with whom they had enjoyed a face-to-face -face relationship when he called them they hid from him in fear and then in response to his questions, they engaged in the blame game. Adam said, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate, casting the initial blame on Eve and the secondary blame on God. Because if he hadn't created the woman, then he might not have been deceived. Eve, on the other hand, said, the serpent deceived me and I ate, casting the initial blame on the serpent, but the secondary blame on God. If you hadn't created the serpent, then I wouldn't have been deceived. Not realising that if God had not created the serpent, then Satan would have used one of the other animals in the garden as his medium. Sin had entered this planet and, with a, and as a result, both Adam and Eve's innocence and immortality were destroyed in the twinkling of an eye. And they, together with all creation and their descendants, became subject to death. 
The arch enemy rejoiced in his easy conquest, for he knew that humankind would now be excluded, like him, from enjoying a future face-to-face -face relationship with God. And through this single act of transgression, Satan, the arch deceiver, became the prince of this world. As he exulted, Satan believed that he had backed God into a corner and that whichever choice God took, he would lose face in the eyes of all the untainted universe. Satan believed that God really only had two choices. Choice number one was he could immediately destroy Adam and Eve and thus rid earth of sin. But if God did that, he would be breaking one of his own commandments, thou shalt not kill. On, and uh, if God did that, he would be viewed by the untainted universe as an uncaring God, an unmerciful God, and a vengeful God. The other option that Satan thought that God had was that he would overlook the transgression and make naught of it. But if God did that, God would be admitting that his holy law was too strict and that no one could keep it. And that was the charge that Lucifer, as the covering cherub, when he led the rebellion on in heaven, laid against the Godhead, that the laws were too strict. He wanted a little bit more democracy in heaven. He wanted more say. He wanted uh, to be valued more. But unknown to Satan, God held an ace up his sleeve, which Satan did not know about. Before his rebellion in heaven, Lucifer as the covering cherub had not been consulted nor had he been advised of the plan of redemption which was formulated before this earth was even created. So at this point we must ask the simple question, what is sin? And put very simply, sin is transgression of God's moral code. And the Apostle John, in his first epistle, says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. It's as simple as that. Sin is simply breaking God's moral code. The topic of my sermon this morning is, therefore, the seven steps to conviction or as some prefer to say, to conversion. Step one. Step one, we must acknowledge that we are a sinner. As a result of the transgression, transgression of our first, parent, uh, first parents, all their descendants, except Christ, who was without <laughs> sin, have an inclination to sin. We have all inherited the fallen nature of Adam and Eve. Paul informs us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul does not say some have sinned. He does not say most have sinned. He does not say some have sinned more than others. He says quite clearly and unequivocally, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now it is important to note at this point that there is no such thing as a little sin or a big sin. There is simply sin. It's like a woman saying, I think I'm a little bit pregnant. It's impossible. She either is or she isn't. And it's the same with sin. You're either a sinner or you're not a sinner. So anyone who transgresses God's holy law is a sinner. Full stop, no ifs, no buts. 
And James, the brother of Jesus, wrote an epistle in which he says, anyone who transgresses God's law in one point, it's the same as if you break every commandment. The very first step on our journey to to conviction, therefore, is to acknowledge that we are sinners. And as hard as we try, in our own strength, we are unable to keep all of God's moral code every day of our lives. And we have sadly reached that point in society where the education system teaches that there was no creation, there is no creator God. And they now teach us fact that we all evolved over millions of years from a single amoeba. And they also teach that the only laws that we need to keep are the laws that are lawfully enacted by the civil authorities. In other words, what they are saying is there is no such thing as sin. But God and his holy law, which endures forever and which is as holy as himself, will not be mocked. None of the inhabitants of this planet can progress to conviction unless they first acknowledge that they have transgressed God's holy law and that they have sinned. Step number two. We have to accept that in our own strength we cannot rid ourselves of sin and that we need a solution outside of ourselves. There is no act that we can perform that can remove sin from our record in heaven. And as sinners, we are condemned to death. Paul tells us... Sorry. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And here Paul's not talking about the first death that is but asleep in the grave. He's talking about the second death from which there is no resurrection. The promise that a way of escape would be found for the fallen humankind was given in the Garden of Eden by God immediately after the fall. For we read in Genesis 3.15, where God says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, that is Jesus, shall crush your head and you, that is Satan, shall bruise his heel. God in his infinite love for the human race could not allow our first parents whom he had lovingly created and their descendants to perish. The transgression of Adam and Eve led to the implementation of the plan of redemption and its successful completion would result in the defeat of Satan as he was defeated at the cross and it will ultimately lead to his final destruction. Step number three. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, we must identify the solution. The plan of redemption was not hurriedly devised when Adam and Eve transgressed because we read in First Peter, he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And in Acts... The Apostle Luke writes, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. We read earlier, in, or I outlined earlier in Romans 6.23, where Paul informed us that the wages of sin is death. But he does not finish the sentence there. 
He goes on to provide us with the solution because he says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus became our kinsman redeemer and voluntarily laid down his life for us. A kinsman simply means a close family member and a redeemer simply means one who is able to reclaim that which was lost or relinquished. As our kinsman redeemer, Jesus set aside the glory that he shared with his Father in heaven and became one like us in form and appearance, but not in character. Jesus reclaimed that that which he had lost in Eden, which had been lost in Eden by Adam and Eve. But in order to reclaim it, Jesus had to offer up his life on a cruel cross. And Paul spells it out beautifully in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8, where he says, But he, that is Jesus, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Step four, we must adopt the solution. Adopting the solution means embracing Jesus as our personal saviour. And embracing Jesus as our personal saviour means we accept wholeheartedly and unreservedly what Jesus has done for us because it was Jesus and Jesus alone who paid the supreme price for our salvation. Although the great Jehovah agreed to complete the plan of redemption, it could not be completed from the courts of heaven. As part of the plan of redemption, Jesus agreed to leave his throne in heaven, set aside the glory that he shared with his father, step down to earth, be born of a woman, and thus he became the son of man, the man of sorrows and the Lamb of God for us. And the promise that was given in the Garden of Eden was fulfilled in the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And the promise that all those who embrace Jesus as their saviour is best embodied in one verse in the Gospel of John. And you all know it so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, some years ago, in the evangelical belt of the United States of America, as a study, some students stood outside all the churches in southern America on this particular Sunday morning. And as the people came out of church, they were asked two questions. Question one was, what is your favourite verse in the Bible? And question two, are you able to recite it? 87% of the people that walked out of church that morning stated John 3.16 and almost all of it, all of them could quote it word perfect. Merely having a theoretical knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God will avail nothing. One has to embrace the Saviour wholeheartedly and unreservedly and accept what he has done for us. Step five, we need to repent for all our sins. As part of adopting the solution, we need to uh, repent. Regret and remorse is not sufficient. 
we read in the Gospel of Matthew, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he, that is Christ, had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went and hanged himself. Judas's remorse did not stem from true repentance for the sin that he had committed, but rather it stemmed from the fact that he believed sincerely that Jesus had come to establish his eternal kingdom centred on Jerusalem. And Judas was the keeper of the money purse on behalf of the apostles. And he could foresee that in this kingdom he would have a very important position. And with that important position would go personal glory. And when he realised, when Jesus was condemned, that what he had believed would not eventuate, he became totally despondent, gave up and hanged himself. Now, Alan G. White speaks about Judas in Desire of Ages, page 718, where she writes, The prospect of Judas having a higher place in the new kingdom had led Judas to espouse the cause of Christ. In other words, he was in it for personal gain and glory. Notwithstanding the Saviour's own teaching, Judas was continually advancing the idea that Christ would reign as king in Jerusalem. The actions of Judas Iscariot contrast with the action of Peter, who, although he betrayed Jesus three times, repented of his folly, and we read in Matthew 26, 75, then Peter remembered the words of Jesus, that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Our merciful and loving God calls upon each one of us to repent of our sins, as he does not wish anyone to perish. We read in the second Peter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not bid us to come to us when we feel that we have made ourselves worthy. Jesus bids us to come to him just as he as we are and he will not turn us away. Step number six, we must confess our sins and seek forgiveness. Every sin that we commit is recorded in the books in heaven, but we have a God who is both merciful and forgiving. We read in Psalms 86.5, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. You are abundant in mercy to all those who call upon your name. In the old sacrificial system, the penitent believer was required to bring a sacrificial animal, usually a lamb, to the tent of the meeting in the wilderness and later the temple. The penitent believer would then confess their sins over the head of the lamb, their sins and the sins of their entire household before it was slain and its blood was sprinkled by the priest on the horns of the altar in the courtyard. And through this action they were granted forgiveness of sin. God instituted the sacrificial system to be a perpetual reminder that the forgiveness of sin requires the death 
of an innocent victim. The sacrificial system pointed forward to the death of Christ at Calvary when Jesus voluntarily offered up his life on a cruel cross at Calvary, type met anti-type, and the sacrificial system that had been practised continuously for 4,000 years came to an end. Since Calvary, we are no longer required to offer the blood of an innocent lamb for the forgiveness of sin, but rather... Paul instructs us in Hebrews 4.16 where he says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. All sins must be confessed. We can hide nothing from God. In Proverbs 28 and 13 is recorded, He who covers or hides his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. The death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus into heaven has opened up a direct line of communication between the triune Godhead and us. Following the ascension of Jesus into heaven on the 30, on year 31 AD, Jesus ministered in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. In October 1844, when the 2,300-year prophecy that is outlined in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, was fulfilled, Jesus moved from the first apartment to the second apartment where he ministers today on our behalf whilst he is conducting the pre-advent judgment. And it is at the pre-advent judgment which is going on at the present time where we have the assurance that when our name is called, Jesus will step forward and offer his precious blood above the law as full payment for our sins. And as Jesus offers his precious blood above the law as full payment, our transgressions are expunged from the record and our record is wiped clean and our transgressions will never be brought to mind again. The sins of the saints will ultimately be placed on the head of the arch deceiver who will pay not only for his sins but for the sins of all the saints. At, uh, following the white throne judgment at the end of the 1,000 years. Step seven, the final step. Conviction or conversion, a new walk with Christ. In our own strength, we cannot change our heart, nor can we change our inclinations. We can only achieve this when this new beginning when we cling to Jesus our Saviour and claim his saving grace and through the working of the Holy Spirit, conviction, conversion will be achieved. We read in 2 Corinthians where Paul tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And as a new creation, we cast aside the earthly distractions and desires and focus wholly and entirely on the only one who is able to save us. And we accept without doubt what Jesus has done for us. Having completed the seven steps and finally been convicted of sin, how do we demonstrate that we have accepted Jesus as our only means of salvation? And in the book of Acts, Luke tells us, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Although uh, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, spoke those words 2,000 years ago, they have echoed down through the ages and they come to us today because we are the ones who are afar off. When we have accepted Jesus as our saviour, the Holy Spirit changes our heart and we demonstrate our acceptance of the gift of salvation by accepting baptism. Where the believer is buried under the water into the death of Christ and then they are raised out of the water into a new life in the likeness of his resurrection. By accepting baptism, we are demonstrating that we have accepted the death of Jesus as full payment for our sins, and we accept in faith that his resurrection offers us life beyond the grave. When we are raised to a new life in Jesus, he becomes the number one spiritual focus in our lives. And because we have the assurance of salvation, we are obedient in all things. We should daily fall on our knees with a contrite heart and acknowledge that we are totally unworthy of salvation. But we have a saviour who has made us worthy. It is Jesus and Jesus alone through his supreme sacrifice at Calvary, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven and his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary that has made us worthy. He took upon himself the second death that was rightfully ours so that we can share in the life that is rightfully his. A wise theologian once said, He that is born once is destined to die twice, but he that is born twice will only die once. Now I want you to ponder on this. If For the one that is born once, which is the natural birth, if they don't accept Jesus as their saviour, they will die twice, which is the first death, which is a, but a sleep, and the second death, which is the eternal death. But he that is born twice, that's the natural birth and the born again experience, will only die once. And this is supported by what Jesus told Nicodemus, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, Verily, and that means where it says verily, it means I am telling you the truth. Nicodemus, I'm telling you the truth. No one can come to enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So let us sum up the seven steps to conviction. We must acknowledge that we are a sinner, step one. Step two, we must accept that we cannot rid ourselves of sin and we need a solution. Step three, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we must identify the solution and the only solution is Jesus. And step four, we must adopt the solution. We must embrace Jesus without any reservation or hesitation. Step five, we need to repent for all the sins that we have committed. Step six, we must confess our sins and seek forgiveness from God. And step seven, conviction, conversion, a new walk with Christ. Those who embrace Jesus as their personal saviour will not be disappointed. We have the promise over and over again in the Bible that God will grant eternal life to those who embrace him. When Jesus returns and every eye will see him, he will raise those who have gone to the, their rest, looking forward to the blessed hope, and he will gather together those who are alive who have joyfully awaited his return. At the second coming, Jesus will personally bestow upon each saint the gift of immortal life. 
And we, the saints, will forever enjoy eternal fellowship with the triune Godhead, the heavenly host and the other saints. We will forever have access to the tree of life and drink from the living waters. As we stand on the sea of glass, Jesus will present us to our heavenly Father and he will introduce us with these words that are recorded in the book of Isaiah. Here am I, Father, and these are the children that thou hast given me. What a glorious day that will be. And we can all say amen to that.